Hello, everyone. I am excited to introduce our next plenary session. The title is Helping Under Students Over the Home, How University of Louisville Student Success Center Approaches Equity. Um, our presenters are Katie Adamchik, Christy Metzinger, Jess Jessica Newton, Jesse Rosenberg, Adam Vitito, and they are all coming from the University of Louisville. So everyone, I'll hand it off to you all. Thank you so much. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're excited to be here um, with you. Today has been quite a Monday for me on and off all these meetings and technology. So I hope everyone is, is doing well. Um, we are going to jump in. I did a similar quick introduction slide. UofL is in the midst of priority registration. And so Jesse Rosenberg um, took on the duty of continuing to advise our students while um, several of us meet and uh, meet with you all today. So she is not with us today, um, but I'm Katie Adamchik. I'm the acting director of the Student Success Center and the director of exploratory and transition advising. And we also have Christy Metzger, our program director for first year experience with us. Jessica Newton, one of our academic counselor seniors for school training transition advising and Greg Vitito, our student success coordinator representative. So to give you a little bit of an overview of the Student Success Center, um, so who we are, we formed in 2018 when our new Belknap Academic Building opened, it was kind of like our big coming together and continuing important work that we've been doing, but integrating three units or departments that previously had different reporting lines, different budgetary lines, um, just worked in different buildings across campus. So part of the last two years has been continuing the work that we've always done and moving forward to integrate our services and to think bigger. Um, and so I like to talk about how we help our students, we help all U of L undergraduate students transition to and through their undergraduate careers by coordinating first year student experiences, providing academic advising for students in transition and offering one-on-one -on -one coaching um, to help students navigate any barriers to the success. So we're gonna really focus on those various areas for our presentation today. Um, and this is a picture of one of our dogs that comes to work um, because one of the things we do is we try to help students de-stress. And so you, you'll see some pictures like that um, with when we have important notices out, um, we might have a friendly um, puppy for folks to come and talk to as well. So hoping to put smiles on folks' faces. All right, so, um, you know, when we think about our work, um, we think first about being student ready, right? So if you think about the book from a few years ago, Becoming, um, becoming a, a Student Ready College um, by one of our keynotes for tomorrow's session. Um, that's a very important message to us all the time because at, at the university, a lot of times our policies and practices are made on an assumption that students are informed and make well-informed decisions and they have all the information they need um, and that, that is what makes them an ideal college student. They're college ready. So for us, it's really meeting our students where they are. Um, who are they? Where are they coming from? What supports do they need right off the start? Um, and so for, you know, so when we think about our work, we often think about our underserved student populations first, because if we think about our underserved student populations, we'll provide services for all students at a much better student ready level. And so of course underserved being who we're talking about at the symposium now are underrepresented minority students or underfunded students. We also talk about our underprepared students, our first generation students. We're talking more about our adult learners. You know, we're really trying to think about who's not traditionally um, well served or met there who whose needs are not typically met at the university um, within our current structures and how do we improve that. So we also focus on being very agile. So that means that if a new need, such as things that have come up with COVID is happening, we continue to advocate and create programs um, to serve students right then. Where are they? You know, what, what do they need in order to be successful? And so that being agile has both, is both a strength of our department, but also a challenge for our department. We think about our strategic planning or what are we doing moving forward? Because if the university needs an office to launch an initiative, um, due to a donor coming forward or due to a student need coming forward, we are 
ready and willing to do it. Sometimes that means other projects get put aside. Sometimes that means assessment gets put aside, but we always need to be able to be um, flexible and ready to serve our students. So today's presentation, we're situating it around this kind of how we do our work framework, because we really do think about the support students need to be successful. Um, first, you know, what information, that kind of college knowledge, things that we know, things that we learned as college students, things the university uses every day in our, our language that, you know, the, the students need help learning and navigating. Um, so what information do they need? How do we help them connect to each other, to our faculty, to our staff? And then a big part of what we're doing now is our advocacy across campus and in the community. You know, we really are looking at policies and procedures and how they impact students we are a centralized reporting unit. So we report through our strategic enrollment management and student success division. So we have sometimes a bird's eye view of as a student moves through all of the systems at the university, how they're being impacted, what's running, what, what, are, what barriers are they running into? What roadblocks are they hitting? Um, and so we look at data, we think about, the, you know, what, which students are kind of fumbling where and how do we advocate for them? You know, we hear students' stories, you know, we share that. We um, investigate those barriers to success. Our Vice Provost Jim Bagani is always asking me about what roadblocks are we seeing now and how can we collaborate across campus to improve those. And then of course we partner around new initiatives to launch, um, launch uh, services to meet today's need. And today's need, right, continues in this current environment to change. You know, this semester we've been launching a program to address the technology gap that is so much wider now because of the reliance on online learning. And so we had to be ready to address that. Within our advocacy, a big part is our data. And I just want you to know that we do a lot of internal data review. So we're not always relying on our IR um, in terms of official reporting. We're just trying to take our queries that we get, do some quick analysis to make sure we understand our, our populations. One of our areas of service that we have been increasing in the last two years is our first generation student programming. So when we look at our first generation students, we think, who are they? Who makes up the first generation population? What other underserved identities or communities do they have or come from? Um, and so this Venn diagram is probably a little bit difficult to, to see, but, but this is a way that we think about our, our students and the needs that they have that need to be addressed. One of the big successes of our advocacy from the Student Success Center is looking at our definition of first generation students. So within the last couple of years, we started critiquing um, what the campus was doing to serve first generation students, who were those first generation students. And for a long time, the University of Louisville used the definition of neither, um, either parent or neither parent or guardian. I'm sorry, Christy might have to help me. Um, <laughs> so our definition was um, either parent or guardian attended college. We used that. Um, and then if they said no, Christy, are you going to? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm reversing. It was, um, neither parent or guardian uh, attended college, period. And so if they, if they had a parent or guardian who had even attended one class, that would mean that they were not technically first generation college student. And so the new definition has changed to neither parent or, or guardian has uh, received, earned a four year college degree. Right, thank you. Yes, so we were really focusing on a success definition, right? If the, if the parent or guardian had graduated, then they were considered successful navigating the system that, the, that their child now is currently trying to navigate. And that's following the trend, the national trend, um, put out with some data put out from NASPA around how we define first generation students. So we know that the first generation student identity intersects you know, the underrepresented student populations, the underserved, um, I'm sorry, underprepared student population or the Pell eligible, um, so underfunded um, population. And so we're really trying to, to, to zero in on those students and their needs with our programming. And so again, our data, you know, is sort of just in time or the, the regular timely data just to say, let's put a check on who the students are now. So with our fresh first year, our first generation student population, we've more than doubled who falls into that category because of changing the definition. Another area that we do advocacy is thinking through how the university relies on the definition of family. So we have some policies around um, a, you know, living, living with your family for a housing exemption, for instance, or um, 
you know, um, how, of course, how we do financial aid. And we can't always make as much headway with financial aid policy interpretation, but maybe internal policies such as a housing one we can make um, some headway with. So right now we're in conversations with the housing office, the re you know, residence life around what is a family and how do we define nuclear family, legal family versus who, fa who kids really live with, right? So, because we know our students coming in oftentimes have not been living with who's on the books as their family. And then they can't navigate our exemption process for our, our residence policies. And so working with housing to share these students' stories and situations that are complex and complicated. And a lot of times those are our, you know, underfunded students. They're gonna have issues with financial aid too if they're not, you know, close with their, their legal guardians. But then they will they will also encounter institutional challenges because of how we are defining um, uh, you know, our policies around an institution that they may not fit. So, so to, to keep going, um, what we're going to do is we are going to kind of break into some our little service areas that I mentioned, our little ones, they're pretty complex and big, um, and just kind of break down some of our work for you and how that work um, focuses on meeting students' needs, meeting them where they are. And when we think about putting that underserved student population first in, in our service definitions, then we know that we're also catching other students as well. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, so I'm Christy. I am going to speak uh, about our first year experience programs. You know, Katie mentioned our desire to um, come to students early and often with information and to, to really begin to focus on just in time delivery of the information that we think that they need at, at different points in the process. And so one of the things that we reevaluated a couple years ago was, you know, we, we know students are getting lots of emails, lots of content, lots of connection. How can we do a better job of not throwing it all at them at once, but really thinking about what is the most important, um, you know, thing to home in on um, in May, in June, in July, in August, September, and so on. And so you're going to see that reflected in the way that our first year experience programs are laid out. Um, I think one of the things that makes our office a little bit unique, maybe less so now um, than a number of years ago, is that um, our first year experience, although we don't coordinate uh, summer orientation for new students, we do pick up at that point and um, carry the students forward all the way through their first year. So at summer orientation, we're in encouraging them to download our UofL New Cards app, these programs that are highlighted in black, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about in just a moment. So they're downloading that app. So they have the all sorts of information uh, whenever they want it and need it the entire summer. Uh, in July, as orientations are wrapped up, we move into one-on-one -on -one summer peer mentoring, which is all online, and are continuing to send uh, messages to them. They, uh, students receive a once-weekly email from their peer mentor, but then, of course, can reach out with individual questions um, along the way. So we tailor the, the general content of that email to be around what we think students will need to hear around that moment, around that week in their transition into the university university in the hopes that we can both have a place where at a large institution the students will be able to know a single person that they can go to with any questions that they have, someone who's a student who's been there just like they have, and additionally hope to address some summer melt issues with you know those last minute freakouts, honestly, of students who begin to think, oh my gosh, this is not for me. I am not cut out for this. I cannot handle this. I think I'm just not even going to come. And we're there to be able to intercept those students and those questions and those challenges and work with them one on one. We also open a one of our three modules that all first year students complete as part of their orientation course. We open that on on August 1st and that's the know before you go module. Um, we know that students are coming into the institution. We need to make sure that on day one, they feel as ready as possible to be successful in their classes. So we reorganized those modules a few years ago with what is it they need to know in those few weeks leading up to class so that on day one, they're ready. What is it 
they need to know in the first few weeks of class. And so we launch that module as the, the semester gets going. And then we have one right around um, the time that students are registering to remind them about academic policies and procedures, how to register for courses, and what they need to be thinking about moving forward. So that time sensitive information is really an important part of the way that we serve all of our students and meet their needs at different times. I mentioned the new cards app. Um, we've had this for a number of years and really um, like this functionality. Um, on the far right of the screen, you're gonna see our homepage, which is where we can highlight upcoming events, uh, where push notifications will land uh, for any student group to whom we wish to send a push notification. So you see, for instance, um, tomorrow, we actually have a first generation student celebration with um, a fantastic UofL alumna who is first gen herself and then is also going to do a follow-up conversation with our Black and Latinx students completely separately. Um, and, and so we're partnering with the Cultural Center on that. And we want to get the word out. We want to make sure students know about that. So we can use the app for that. Um, push notifications are great because we're able to send those out you know, to, the all, to the entire audience or to subsets. So whether that's Black and Latinx students or first-gen students only, um, we are able to do that. I think one of the things that uh, we certainly see students utilizing a lot is our frequent resources page. So frequent contacts will direct them to what does this office do? You know, I keep hearing about the Bursar. What is the Bursar's office? So all of those contacts are going to have a description. You can call directly from within the app. You can go to the web page from within the app and you can find yourself on the map um, where you are relevant to uh, that lo office location and be able to kind of be the moving blue dot who heads there on the map. Another important resource for our um, underrepresented and uh, Pell eligible low income students are the things like the Concern Center, the Student Success Coordinator link, um, our link directly to the Cardinal Cupboard um, pantry that we have. So we're able to get resources into the hands of students, again, whenever they want to, and hopefully they're, this is eliminating the navigating of that, of you know, a very complex system, website, so on and so forth. Um, what we do see in looking at some of the numbers of our app usage is that our um, underrepresented minority students and low income students are actually using it at rates that are slightly higher than the, the general student population. Um, we have about, I'm looking to see about 86% of our student body overall is using the app at some point um, versus 90% of our um, URM population, and while about 46% of our student population is using it into and through the fall, um, more like 51% of our underrepresented minority population is within that app. Um, so we like seeing that um, not only is this a support to students, but it might be a more important support um, to some than others. I just want to highlight quickly, we do a from scratch planner. Again, it hits on those key transition points and areas of challenge um, with monthly just in time, important dates, deadlines, and steps to success to help them think about at this point in the semester, this is what I need to be thinking about. Um, we do provide that to all first year students for free. Um, we additionally make sure that all trio students get uh, get that and any student who is in a mentoring program through the cultural center will also get a free copy, regardless of whether they are a first year student or not. Keys to Success is one of those programs uh, that Katie referenced where, you know, we had an opportunity with a donation of 700 laptops and that opportunity was passed along to the Student Success Center to make happen. And uh, it was a, a very quick bring it up, how are we gonna do it? How are we gonna do it successfully and get the word out? First time freshmen and transfer students um, who were uh, in financial need in the greatest area of financial need were initially invited um, to apply for the program. The laptop is technically on loan for the next three years. And as long as a student remains continuously enrolled each fall and semester for the next three years, or if they graduate first, lucky them, uh, they will, basically earn the ownership of that laptop. Um, if they stop out sooner, then they would return that or work with the Student Success Center on what their situation is. But it becomes their laptop. It is serviced um, through IT with a three-year warranty for that entire time. So we're able to um, 
you know, really support students who are having that technology gap and we were able to be proactive in that, um, anticipating that in such a, a heavy uh, technology need um, environment right now, this fall and of course into the spring, students are going to need uh, technology that works. Ready Mentoring is another program that came to us um, through interest from PNC Bank. Um, Chuck Denny, our, the regional president of PNC, brought to Neely Bendapudi uh, an idea to you know, help our students who are most in need. And so it is an opt-in, first-gen, low-income, first-time freshman audience. Mentoring happens twice a month. And if the students attend all six of their fall sessions, then they become eligible. They do receive a $500 grant toward their spring enrollment. So this time it's going to be spring 2021. This is the second year that we have um, our second cohort for Ready Mentoring fall 2019 was the first time that we had done that. Um, and it was a great success. I'm going to get into it in just a minute, but I want to share a quick video about four minutes with you about the program to give you some perspective, not just on the program itself, but because these uh, students that you're going to hear from also share the characteristics that we are talking about today. I think being a first generation college student is like being a, a tourist in a place you've never been. And you know that you're coming with so many expectations, not just your own, but your families and your communities. How do you survive? So to me, a mentor that steps up to help is like a guide who will say, here's the terrain, here's what you need to navigate, uh, here's how you advocate for yourself, here are the paths open to you. The Ready Mentoring Program supports first generation, first time freshmen, low income students in making that transition from high school to college. It's um, an amazing program. I love that it reaches out to first generational students. It allows for students to have support that they don't get from other advisors or professors. Being able to be a part of the mentor program really allowed me to see a different lens of being a freshman on campus and different struggles that freshmen have of you know, they don't have transportation to get home on you know fall break or you know they're not meeting anyone on campus or they're having roommate struggles uh, along with all of the studies that they have to do and, and to stay focused with time management one of the great things that we found is that the mentor is able to find and encounter and discover issues that the students are experiencing even before uh, typically our university staff would have maybe known that that was happening. So there are first line of defense in many cases. You get to sit down and talk to this person. It helps me spill like the stuff that I'm, that's going on during a certain week. It's like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I don't usually get that to talk about myself. We would just talk about life stuff, honestly. The thing that kind of pulled me in was the concept of the mentorship, because that's what I need at the time. I never really had somebody that was like actively there, focused on my going on to like my day-to-day -day life and just like trying to like help. And I get to talk to somebody that just knows me, and that is and that is there for my best interest. Not because it's like an exclusive thing, it's because I just need it. One of the things that makes the Ready Mentoring unique is that these professional mentors aren't working with juniors and seniors toward career preparedness. They're working with freshmen, first time college going students to help them with both in class and out of class issues that they encounter. Uh, they might be talking about career readiness. They might be talking about some of those topics, but more or less they're talking about the student's college experience. And that is not what a traditional professional mentoring program is going to try and accomplish. I was a first generation college student. Before I knew what that meant, it became a motivation. And uh, the more research I did, I saw this was a, a problem of what most America. Something is causing the first gen student to have a tougher time. If you want to make a difference, focus on that population because they're having the hardest time getting out. There is a lot of pressure going into college as a first generation student. My brother didn't go to college. He went straight off to the Air Force. So all of that pressure honestly has come down to me. I've been faced with the real world, handling money, handling time management. You know, I, I don't have my parents here to constantly show me what I need to do. You know, that all that responsibility falls on me. I will admit, being a first-gen student, it was a little bit different. I didn't really have expertise of, you know, someone 
whose parents has masters, PhDs, they can tell them, hey, here's what to expect, here's what not to do, here's what to do. The only thing I had was common sense to guide me. So for me, it was, it was different on that fact. I didn't have. I quickly learned to ask questions. You have all these places, but you don't really have a, an idea of where to kind of go from there. You kind of just have a map, but you don't have like a central idea of where to, you're going to be coming from, where you're going to be going, what to do, what you don't need and what you do need. I've been somebody that is very uh, like academically focused according to the school and the background I come from, but everything beyond that is something that I really think that I would like help with because considering my family background, I don't really know how to network. I don't really have that experience. If you're wanting help, if you're genuinely wanting help, I would tell you go try to get involved in the program. All right. Is it sharing correctly now? I, I'm no, not. still has no. the notes. Oh. Sorry, you all. <laughs> you should be able to click the three dots up if you go back. The three dots at the bottom. Yes. Yep. And then high presenter view. Yes. <laughs> and then, now you can see it correctly. Um, resume the slideshow. And we'll see. It's resumed. Um, oh, okay. Let me, um, here we go. Let me share the other screen. How's that? Perfect. Perfect. Yay. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to look at you all and not at the slideshow. Um, so I'm sorry. I'm going to have to pay attention by looking down at my, at my notes on what on what slide I'm on. Um, so one of the things, can I um, advance it on this page? There we go, okay. Thank you all. Um, I, I don't wanna get too deep into the, the numbers here. I, I wanna move on, but um, you see that a number of our students are, um, they're all of course first gen Pell eligible. That's part of the criteria. 50% to 55% um, are that underrepresented minority student. Um, and you see that uh, overall the results are fantastic, both for um, all participants. You know, we saw about a 7% higher fall to spring return rate, a higher GPA, higher credit hours earned. There was almost no difference in um, fall 2019 of the difference between mean high school GPA, ACT, and unmet need for participants versus non-participants. And while we know there might be a self-selection bias, we don't think that that counts for the entire amount of variance um, given the student evaluation. They talked about um, you know, on Likert scale, gain confidence in myself, feel like U of L cares about me and my success, navigating resources and connecting to campus resources for academic and social success. Those were all agree, strongly agree um, uh, for almost every student. And 100% of the 67 survey respondents said that they would encourage students like them to participate in the program when we ran it again in fall 2020. Um, so something um, good is going on there. We'd like to dig into it more and we hope to grow and expand the program. You know, we know students are getting support from their mentor. These are quotes from them when they're italicized. I think it's really important to note that one of the things that we think has helped us be successful with the program is the mentors because they're having sustained conversation with these students are hearing about problems before we as an institution, whether it's their RA, their orientation course instructor, their mentor, um, even a student success coordinator, we are those mentors are hearing about and able to help us intervene in challenges before we have traditionally known that those were going on. So they're bubbling up in those mentoring sessions and the mentor works with a student success coordinator to make sure that we're addressing those student um, issues one-to-one. -one. We're informing the students. Um, and I think, you know, again, we're learning more about the issues and the challenges and the experiences of our students and able to advocate in different ways.
finally, uh, the Student Success Series is a new initiative um, as of this year. We wanted to make sure that we were able to provide outreach and support to students throughout the entire year, um, particularly this fall semester. And so we've um, designed a number of programs that are workshops, um, ways to connect. One of the most successful has been virtual bingo, where we've had um, upwards of 80 students uh, every time participate either in person or online. This month it will be entirely online uh, due to the increased COVID restrictions. Um, but you know we're looking for opportunities and ways to engage um, our students and support them, um, not just with information, but also with some ways to connect socially, which is still so very important to our students who are struggling to stay motivated and connected or even connect for the first time with the university in their experience. So that wraps up um, me talking about first year experience. So I'm gonna transition to Jessica who will share more about exploratory and transition advising at UofL. Thank you, Christy. Uh, so first, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jessica Newton and I've been a member of the exploratory and transition advising team within the SSC for nearly five years. Uh, so we are a team of seven advisors and we serve a huge population of students at the university. So our students make up the second largest incoming advising unit uh, at the university behind the College of Arts and Sciences. And in the fall, we typically have between 1,500 and 1,800 students with us in exploratory. Our numbers definitely tend to grow in the fall with incoming students and then reduce in the spring as students are either choosing their major or becoming admissible to their major of choice. Uh, but we do have a lot of interactions with students on campus. Our exploratory population consists of students who are undecided or exploring majors, pre-unit students, so students who are not yet admissible to their unit or major of choice, students who are transitioning between majors, and also transfer and returning students to UofL. So we really interact with all students at some point at UofL. Underserved students, so students who are underrepresented minority students, underfunded and Pell eligible, first generation, and students who are considered underprepared are all actually overrepresented represent, represented uh, within our pre-unit population compared to the other students at UofL. And so being aware that our populations of students looks like this, that is key for us. And it's something that we intentionally think about as we plan in the SSC with every service that we offer, with our advising practice, and all of the individual interactions that we have with students uh, throughout the year. So I wanna talk about some of the services that we offer, offer within the exploratory and transition advising. And I'll focus on some. So our goal in exploratory advising is to be as visible and accessible as possible so we can help students find their way in college. Our office is centrally located front and center in one of the busiest classroom buildings on campus. And because of this, we get to interact with a lot of different students outside of exploratory. We get a lot of student traffic from other units, from other offices. We offer individual advising appointments from the very beginning. Uh, we do individual advising at summer orientation for um, incoming freshmen. And then we also require individual advising appointments every semester to check in with our students. Typically our appointments are 30 minutes, um, but we do try to offer hour long appointments when our semester schedule allows to really give us more time with our students to dive deep and to help them figure out their college journey. We assign students to advisors and we really stick with those advisor assignments as much as possible because we know that building relationships is key for helping students understand college and navigate this process. And it's really important for our exploratory population. We know that getting to know each other early on, building that rapport, that gives us more time in the future to focus on their student needs beyond course planning and just go beyond that surface level. At strategic points throughout the semester, so the beginning when students are registering that add drop week, and also in the middle toward the late end of the semester where freshmen and sophomores are starting to register for the upcoming semester, we offer drop in registration assistance to help students navigate this process as many of them are new to college, they may not have others to rely on for this type of support, and we know that this process can be very complicated. So every fall we typically serve over 100 students with this um, during drop-in assistance and we know it's needed. We know it's working and students appreciate the help. And I think something really unique that we do is that all of our advisors have office hours. We hold office hours every week. 
for students to get in contact with us if they're experiencing an issue or they have a question about something. Um, and we typically hold three to five office hours, um, so at least an hour every day, especially while we're teaching. And it's a great opportunity for our students to get connected with us. And we're also highly visible and accessible in the classroom. So we're in the class with our students as either part of their first year experience course, which I'll talk about more in just a minute, or as co-instructors of a Find Your Fit course that's a QEP initiative here at UofL geared towards second year students or upperclassmen who are undecided or maybe questioning their major or want to explore their major and career options. And it's a course focused on academic and personal success. So again, you don't have to be an exploratory student to take that course. This gives us another opportunity to connect with all students on campus, even those outside the exploratory population. Um, our advising practice is really centered on major and career integrated advising. So we integrate major and career conversations in all that we do. We know that early on, many of our students, especially those among exploratory populations, are seeking a connection between the major they may select and the future career path that they may take. So this is especially true for our first gen students, but right now that feels really true for all students based on what's going on in the world. But we try to teach our students that major does not equal career and that we encourage students to consider something that aligns well with who they are, the skills that they have, and to see what may be important for them and their unique needs for their future. Um, so we dive into that into our conversations and advising and we also jump into that in our courses that I'll talk about. Um, we also go beyond that major and career conversation with their appointments to teach students about resources that UofL offers and to help them understand how to use those resources or how to access or really maximize those resources based on what they need. Especially for our first gen students and for students who are underprepared, we sometimes act as interpreters or even guides, do a little hand holding maybe um, to help our students understand and respond to policies and university procedures that we know are complex. I would say rarely do I have an advising appointment or anybody on our team where we're not making referrals to other resources on campus, reaching out to other offices to help students address an issue, or even initiating conversations on a student's behalf to get a problem solved. I also do sort of a soft welcome or a soft initiation to get students comfortable with talking to other people. And we help students network within our own networks too and connect them to professionals on campus and within the community to help them make a decision or to help meet a need that needs to be met. Um, our office is an office that puts a lot of effort in maintaining relationships and building relationships with all the academic units on campus and a lot of the university offices too. Um, so that we're up to date on relevant information, we know opportunities exist, also, we can better serve our students. We like to tell our students that we know a little bit about everything, um, just enough to get you started, which helps our students understand that they can come to us for more than just course planning and that when they're unsure who to turn to, we can be a part of that process. And we definitely leverage our position on campus to help advocate for students in a lot of situations and hold the university accountable to make sure that we are all serving our students to the best of our ability. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our Gen 100 course, which is the orientation course that we offer. So the SSC requires that all new incoming students take our orientation course, where we focus on helping students critically think about their individual journey to and through college. So we know that every student's story is unique, and we reiterate that uniqueness of their own individual path at UofL, and we start this conversation from day one. That really shows that we value that. Our, code, or our course kind of fit, features a flipped model of success. And so at the very, very beginning, we focus on students' intrinsic motivation and their why for being in college. Then later on in the semester, we start to incorporate major and career research, planning stuff, um, exposure to resources to help them succeed. Because we know if a student doesn't know why they're in college, or they're not under, you know, they're feeling overwhelmed in the beginning, we know that they're less likely to be engaged, less likely to be engaged and take advantage of some of the resources we want them to know about. Storytelling, self-exploration, identity formation are all huge components of the course that we teach 
because we ask students to think about themselves, their personality type, their strengths, their values, their decision making process, who's influencing these decisions and the barriers that they may face all while they're trying to navigate what they want out of this experience. So we work with our students to craft their own definition of success, what that looks like for them and what that looks like here at U of L. We do offer some special sections of Gen 100 for some student groups. Um, we've offered sections for first gen students and black males with the partnership through the cultural center. But we also have a campus partner right now with the Muhammad Ali Institute who teaches a Gen 100 section. And we have future plans to amplify that partnership to offer a section maybe focused on social justice. Um, and so we've got some future planning in the works too. And at the end of the course, we take all the information that the students are learning about themselves and that we're learning about them and we add it to their EAB profile so that it's readily accessible for advisors during our advising meetings but it's also accessible for others across campus in the cultural center or in advising in athletics or reach even um, so that they know this information about our students as well. Uh, everyone within the SSC, so all staff members teach Gen 100. So from the very beginning, our students are connected to the SSC. As advisors, we teach Gen 100, but we're also paired with any section that's not led by an advisor and we're in the classroom at strategic points throughout the semester to start building a connection with our students early on. Our course connects with other campus partners uh, for course assignments and activities like the Office of Diversity Education and Inclusive Excellence to provide training, valuable resources, information for students who are just starting their journey at UofL. And we really hope that by incorporating this into our course and devoting time to have real and open conversations in this class, we hope that students take away from this, that we value diversity, that U of L values diversity, that we're working on valuing it more, and that we support any and all students at all times, whatever their needs may be. So we know that each student takes a different path to us in exploratory advising, and we work really hard to provide opportunities to help all of our students find their fit in college, whatever that looks like for them. Learning our st students' stories along the way and their aspirations and goals and plans um, really helps us better serve them. And most of all, we try to teach our students that when they leave us, when they transition to their new unit or major, that they can still advocate for themselves and utilize the resources that we've taught them about. So we want them to learn, we learn from our students and they learn from us, um, but we take this information and we use it to inform our practice and we also use it to advocate for our students and their needs in conversations that we're having across campus and then everything that we're doing in the SSC and want to do in the future. And I will hand it over to Greg, who's going to talk a little bit about our student success coaching. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as she said, my name is Greg Vitito. I'm a student success coordinator is the official title that I have uh, for the purpose of the presentation and better describing what we do. We're talking about our role as student success coaches. So if you hear me say student success coordinator, it's the same thing. Um, I've been in this role since 2014 uh, and was the first student success coordinator and we've since grown. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But first, what do we do? So the bottom line is our goal is to find students who are experiencing a barrier to their, their success and help them overcome it. Um, so we do that through uh, meeting with students as our primary and preferred method. So we're always trying to find students to meet with, to learn more about their situation and help them to overcome. And I will go into much more detail about what that means. There are four student success coaches right now. Uh, we just we just hired a fourth who will be starting soon. So technically we've been operating with three and those three have served the entire uh, degree seeking undergraduate population. Uh, and we split it up by alphabet. That probably sounds like um, that's kind of crazy. And how do you do that? And I'd like to clarify that even though we are assigned to that many students, um, we only serve a small subset of that group. So you kind of have the way we've seen it over the years is you have students who will never respond to outreach, uh, will never contact us regardless of our efforts. And then we have on the other end of the spectrum, students who will graduate and, and do well and never need our services. Uh, so 
our group is really that toward the toward the end of the, it's the students who are going to struggle or are struggling but uh, are willing to respond to outreach they're looking for tools they're looking for assistance and they tend to end up in our offices or virtual offices these days on our website we have this list of things that contact us when so this is aimed toward the students uh, so just to hit on, on a few of these that we see a lot which are some of the first ones you're worried about paying a bill. Um, we have kind of found our niche in helping students with financial issues. Um, we have access to a grant fund that we can use to help students. And we use that um, to help students directly with money, but also as a way to get them in our office. Um, as many of you know, there's never just one issue. So if a student is having trouble paying a bill, that means that they're underfunded more than likely. Uh, but there's also other things going on that come up in the meetings about the bills. Um, so second one, you want to make a sustainable financial plan. So we do a lot of financial planning, meeting with students one on one, going through their personal budget, uh, looking at the, their long term ability to pay for school. Uh, you know, Money is the number one reason that students say that they leave the university and we want to head head that off early on. Uh, students contact us when they're struggling with academic habits. So, you know, one of the things that I will meet with related to academics, so I'm not a tutor, obviously, um, but I get students that say, I procrastinate a lot, or I'm just not motivated. And we get together and really dig into what that means, try to find out what the source of that is, and help them to overcome it. Uh, personal issues affecting grades. So students have things going on in their families, with their friends, um, all kinds of things. Mental health issues is very common. Uh, and those affect their grades. So we want them to come talk to us in that situation as well. Um, let's see, not sure if college is for you. you know, this is a fairly common with, with freshmen, particularly the new freshmen, like this semester, for example, um, I get students that I'm meeting with who, uh, first one that comes to mind is someone who wasn't connected, she wasn't connected to her major. Uh, she's in a bioengineering program, uh, really wants to be a nurse, but her family's really pressuring her to be in um, bioengineering. So we've had some really great in-depth conversations about you know, her and what she wants, who she is, and then also how to talk with her family about the, the things that she's experiencing. So just a few things, uh, examples of when students will contact us. Well, how do we get the students in our office? Well, no one is required to meet with us. So we rely on referrals and outreach for the most part. So we get referrals from mostly from staff around campus, the advising community primarily, uh, but also the registrar's office, the uh, bursar's office, financial aid, admissions, uh, all the enrollment management units will uh, refer students to us. Uh, a few faculty have really started to uh, contact us regularly and we hope to grow that over time. And then student to student, if um, a student has a good experience, they tell other students, and I very commonly hear my friend so-and-so referred me and said you might be able to help with X issue, and we try our best to do that. And then outreach. So when we first started this role six years ago, we didn't get any referrals at all because no one knew that we existed or what we did. So everything that we got was a result of outreach. So we kind of learned some things that worked along the way on who to, who to target. Uh, students that were showing academic issues, it's obviously a concern, but some things that we looked at in particular are um, a drop in GPA. So if a student had a term GPA that dropped significantly from say a spring to a fall semester, that following spring is when we would notice that and we would do outreach to those students. Um, another academic method is looking at progress reports. So our faculty are asked to submit progress reports on students in mid-semester, and we are given a list of the students who get two or more progress reports stating that they are at risk to fail a class. Uh, and we do outreach to them and talk with them about what's going on, see if they can recover um, and help them or, or withdraw if that's what's in their best interest. Uh, financial issues. So some signs that a student is dealing with a financial issue, if they lose financial aid due to not meeting the financial aid requirements of satisfactory academic progress, clearly an issue. Uh, we reach out to them and offer to help them with an appeal 
and then through that appeal process, we really learn what's going on and how they ended up with a SAP hold in the first place. Uh, outstanding balances. This is our bread and butter in terms of getting students in our office. Um, when, if, if you think about the students who we reach out to and we say, we noticed you had a drastic drop in your GPA, that's a little more threatening sounding to them than, hey, we saw you had an outstanding balance and thought we might be able to help. So it's a non-threatening way of getting in front of students. And once they're in our office, we find out all the other issues uh, after that. But because of the easy open to that conversation, it's been really productive. And then students who are not returning to the university. So we have students that are eligible to, en to enroll but are not registered for the following semester. Uh, we do a lot of outreach to that group to find out why they're not enrolled uh, and help them through the process of either getting there or finding out why they're not enrolled, et cetera. And then stopouts, uh, students that have stopped attending the university. Uh, early on when I was in this position, we did a lot of outreach to stopouts to try to help them to come back to the university. Our load has increased so much and we get so many referrals uh, and we don't have the time. So other units, we've saw some success with that. Now other units have taken the lead on working with those stopout students, primarily the admissions office. And then students find us now. So we are now listed as a part of their success team in the EAB platform. So students will see us there and contact us to see how we can help. So looking at the philosophy that Katie mentioned in the beginning, this philosophy of support, information, connections, and advocacy. I'm gonna run through the four of those and how we uh, foster those. So in terms of support, uh, our goal is to be someone that they will view as being non-judgmental and supportive from the, from the get-go. So that, that comes across in the way that we do our outreach, the emails that we send, everything is personal and conversational. And when they meet with us, you know, I want them to feel like um, they're, they're not being judged. There's nothing they can say that's going to make us not want to help them or think that they're not a good student or whatever it is that their fear might be. So we want to meet them where they are and do what is necessary. So when I say do what is necessary, I say that intentionally because there's no one way to help a student. It depends on what they need. So to give you some examples, um, we have students that... Um, let me think of the best example to give you here. Uh, one example is a student needed an IRS transcript uh, for the financial aid office as a part of verification. Uh, one of the student success coaches went to the appointment, to the financial aid appointment with the student, helped the student understand what was needed, and because the student lacked transportation, actually took the student to the uh, IRS office in downtown Louisville to uh, get the transcript. Now that's above and beyond for sure, and that's not typical, but that's just the do what is necessary piece of that. Um, I have helped a student file taxes uh, to help her uh, fill out the FAFSA. I've helped students understand how car insurance works. Um, I've escorted them to the counseling center. And again, going to the financial aid appointments with them to help them to in interpret what they're being told. So we support them in any way that they need it, whatever that means. And when I tell students what we do, I, I always tell them that we help with everything from basic, easy questions up to my life is falling apart and I don't know what to do and everything in between. And almost all of them say, I'm more of that second part. <laughs> um, okay, persistence grants. This is another form of support. Uh, we have access to a grant fund where we can uh, award students up to $2,500 to help a student get past a one-time financial barrier. And that is not necessarily a policy, it's a practice that we follow. We have given more than that uh, for certain circumstances, but we try to stay consistent. And we've also given more than one award. Uh, if, if the awards add up to less than 2,500, we often will give more than one. And we found over time that the students who need them the most often need more than one of a smaller amount. So what I think is great about these persistence grants is we, we have the discretion in our office to give them and we make the decision on the spot with the student in front of us. Uh, there's no application. And generally speaking, the students don't even know that we have the money when they're talking with us. So we are hearing their genuine, authentic story and able to make a decision to help them financially based on what they say. Um, so no application at all. We decide to give them a grant 
uh, we can award them quickly. We can apply it the same day, next day. Um, and they, we can use it to pay a university balance if it's an issue of being able to register for the next semester, or if they don't owe money, we can give them uh, money to, for a personal issue. So we pay for everything from car repairs to medicine. Um, I had an undocumented student who worked really hard every semester to pay full tuition and fell short once. We used a grant to help with that. Uh, books, uh, books, I mean, lots of students need books, but there's certain circumstances where if you take a, a student who um, is underrepresented, underfunded, they're missing one book, their first gen, and they feel different than all the other students around them who have books, uh, it's, it sort of becomes a, a snowball effect where that one thing, that one thing that's really bothering them can snowball, then they don't do well academically. And, the beginning of the course and things just get out of control. So that one book can make the difference. And not only is it financial, it's also that um, the idea that, okay, we see where you are and we're helping you. So they feel validated and understood at the same time. So we, at the beginning of the year, we took a look at how many awards we've given and kind of who we gave them to. Uh, this was the first time that we actually looked at it, so we want to dig a lot deeper into this, but just at a glance, uh, we saw that we had given 717 awards from the fall semester of 2014 until January of 2020. 61% uh, of those female, 38.1 male, 0.8 unknown. Uh, the key stat here, 78.5% of recipients persisted to the next semester or graduated. Now, we need to really dig into that and figure out what that means and, and is it a success? Uh, my hunch is just from being one of the people that meets with these students is that let's, th there's probably some percentage who would not have persisted. That's what we don't know. But if, um, if that number would have been 50, 78.5 uh, is a huge, a huge leap. So we need to kind of figure out uh, more specifics on that. And then it's also notable that uh, roughly 52% of the recipients are non-white. Okay, information. I talked a little bit about financial planning. So we're always sharing information on how they can afford school, university processes and functions. Uh, we are familiar with the processes and functions across the university. We know people uh, in all the different offices where, where the students can be helped. So we kind of serve as a point person, a go-to. We help them organize the processes that they need to do, walk them through it as necessary uh, and work to find answers with them. Uh, advocacy. And I'll kind of say connections in this as well, because I didn't have that as a separate uh, bullet. We, um, we use our university-wide knowledge for creative problem solving. So we are always looking for how do the different offices work together? How, where do policies and procedures pose a barrier? Where do they overlap? How can we use them to our advantage to help a student through a situation? And um, we, we're, we're fortunate that we have the knowledge that we do and have that top-down view, which is really, really helpful. Uh, and then we advocate on behalf of students directly when policies or procedures create barriers. Uh, and I, the next bullet, share student experience with campus community. Uh, sometimes there are policies and procedures in place that assume that a student is capable of doing things the way that they need to be done. And sometimes our students that fall into the populations we're discussing may not be able to do that. And we meet them where they are, help them to um, kind of handhold them, which a lot of, a lot of people say handholding is bad with a college student. I don't agree with that. Uh, these students often need that. And then over time, they don't need it anymore. So over the course of my time in six years, I've seen students who needed that in the beginning and then later didn't need it at all. And then I just become a check-in point for them. And then collaborations and partnerships across campus. Uh, we are always uh, talking with other units, other offices on ways that we can partner and collaborate to make um, policies and procedures easier for students to navigate uh, and easier for students to uh, get through and graduate. All right, I'll turn it over to Katie to wrap up. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Um, I know we're close to time and we have a couple questions going in, so I'll just um, keep my comments brief as I wrap up. But you know, again, um, while we believe student success is everyone's responsibility, um, we also um, advocate within 
our subpopulations that we're all responsible. So for a while there was a mantra sort of on campus about um, our underrepresented minority students success and where that was that belonged and who was responsible and it wasn't holding the whole campus, the whole campus responsible. And so we really push this idea that we're all responsible. So therefore I participate very actively with our DEI division as much as possible within our diversity plan and report that we do for CPE. You know, how do we work on this together? Any initiatives they have, we, we're, we're trying to increase our partnerships. Um, we continue to, to want to share data. We also push for more disaggregated data at the university to understand, you know, not just maybe how students are successful in a particular academic department, but who's not successful in that academic department versus who is successful. So pull it apart. Don't just say that 75% of entering students with this major graduate with it. Who's not graduating with it? What barriers can we look for in the classroom that they're experiencing? You know, um, Aaron Thompson mentioned this morning that he's a sociologist and how he reads things. And I'm also a sociologist, right? So the ideal type student rarely, if ever, exists. But yet all of our policies are written as if all students are the ideal type. And that is where we come in and advocate from, that perspective that, that these students don't exist. And so when the students are struggling with the policy or meeting the documentation requirements, we have to help our departments see that. We have really improved our conversations. You know, We're learning each other's language, whether it's us learning housing's language, housing learning ours, financial aid learning each other's. Um, and so that's a big piece of what we have to do, right? Um, policies were written by somebody, policies can be rewritten by somebody, right? Um, and so advocacy is huge for us, you know, so it can't just be college knowledge, it can't just be financial resources, it can't just be I'm here for you, what do you need to help students be successful, it has to be all of those pieces together. So we every day work to see how we can continue our partnerships, whether it's on campus or in the community. You know, we're two years old. I feel like, oh my gosh, we've been around two years, but every year has been a transition, right? We've had COVID, we had a new building, we brought teams together. So we have a lot of work to do, including improving our ongoing assessment, continuing our program growth and what we wanna do, doing our own fundraising. We just did this image right here is from our Race ML. We focused on fundraising for completer grants when students run out of financial aid in their very last semester and they can't pay. They can't pay. No, they're not going to persist, but they're going to graduate and we need to be able to help them. And then we're always really conscious about who our staff is. Do they represent our student populations? How we market and recruit our positions, how we're doing our hiring. We talk with Diane Whitlock frequently about our open positions. So you all probably know Diane, you know, how can we recruit better? So um, Christy, will you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so this is our question slide, just a little bit more about support, inform, and connect. And then this is um, one of our coordinators, or our coaches tagline, ask us anything, no really anything. And so I wanted to make sure that we could carve into a couple minutes um, to see what questions have popped up. Thank you for those of you who do have to pop off. I know that I've been in between the, this wonderful symposium and meetings all day. And so I'm sure you all are in the same boat as us. So um, let's see. Hi. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for your presentation, all of you. I had a great time. I learned a lot. I have pages full of notes. Um, so we are we are um, at the end of the presentation, but I did want to ask a question. Um, so the question that we've been asking everyone um, after each presentation is: This is the urgency of now, and uh, so if there was one thing that we can take, give to our our participants who are, who are who are viewers who are watching this, what's one thing that, uh, that they can take away that can uh, provide more of a sense of equity on their campus? Um, the immediate thing that comes to mind for me is the what I've learned, especially this semester, as I've advocated with other offices on what our students need, is find a way to say yes. Let's put our heads together. Don't say no, right? Um, if we're advocating because students need something, it, we cannot wait and do strategic planning around it and think long term. You know, we've got to act now. How do we adjust our services, our capacity, you know, with keeping our staff sane? Because that is a huge piece for me. I need to keep my staff. I need to keep them sane. I need to keep them supported. Um, but how do we say this is not the priority right now? We love doing this 
but right now this is what our students need. And so I, with my campus partners, I wanna help them figure out a way to say yes, because actually I've been told no a lot this semester and I've been fairly frustrated, but the more you talk and the more you ask and the more you push and the more creative you are, you find solutions together and we've had successes, but I'm surprised when I'm told no, because you know, the urgency is now, right? It's not next year. This is what our students need right now. Yes. Well, um, I would like to say that this has been a very informative uh, presentation. Thank you all for your time and your effort. I know it's, it's, it's a lot in the midst of a pandemic to come together and do something like this, but we, we really appreciate it. Um, I, I've, I've enjoyed uh, learning from you all and getting a little piece of what you all, what's going on at, at the University of Louisville. Um, so, um, but yeah, oh, here's your contact information. Thank you all, I appreciate yes. it. There were a couple quick questions about international students considered in our programs. They are, you know, for our size university, we have a very small international student population. And so while they're included in our first year experience programs or our advising as needed, they're not necessarily the a target as much as maybe they should be. So I appreciate the question because I was thinking, oh, I should probably talk with Thomas Beard in our international center about where else. We've done some strategic planning university level work together to strategize some initiatives, but I think that's another area. And then there was something about our average individual grants and I, we had that number, I think it's around 1400. If you wanted to shoot me an email, I could, um, could dig into that for more if you all are trying to plan around what type of grant structure you all want. Awesome, well, perfect. Um, yeah, once again, thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Dawn Offit, and she's going to have our closing for the day. Again, thank you for um, that very informative presentation. I've seen a lot of comments that were talking about how great the information has been. So I thank you for that. Um, everyone else, thank you for um, spending the day with us. We hope that you have found some great information. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow at day two, where we'll start out with our networking session. If you all did not have a chance to sign in uh, this morning, um, come join us and get a chance to know some of the colleagues. Think about it as if you were um, having breakfast um, at a session if we were together and you'd be sitting down at a table and you'd just be networking and getting to know other people um, in your field that work across the state. Then we'll have uh, more information about how we can support students specifically um, through uh, this pandemic and um, th through beyond the challenges in the classroom, how we're we supporting the whole students. We are gonna have our keynote uh, session at the lunchtime from Equity Talk to Equity Walk from Tia McNair. And um, at the end of that, we're actually gonna hear from students. We always like to make sure that we get that student perspective and they're gonna to talk to us a little bit about what it's like at the intersection. So we hope to see you uh, bright and early uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you for hanging out with us today. We hope you've gotten some great information and we will see you tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.